I'm Jason Paul, I'm the CTO of Causata. Uh, Causata is a startup um, based in Silicon Valley, actually, but all of the engineering is in London, interestingly. And I won't give you a big sales pitch on Causata because we've had a long day. It's shaped up, so you've got a long evening, frankly, after the raffle. Um, but what we do, basically, we do marketing automation. So we're a big data company. Our customers are large enterprises, big banks, big retailers, companies with lots of customers themselves. We take all of their customer data and we automate their marketing, intelligently automate their marketing. So if you like, it's CRM meets machine learning, meets big data, and meets real time. I'm not really going to talk too much about Causata. I'm going to talk about really the interesting problems that we need to solve in what we're doing. So I'll tell you just enough about Causata to motivate what we're doing. But what we're really trying to do is to help marketers to market intelligently. And that's where cause and effect comes in. Because Marketers want to change their customers' behavior. They want to influence their customers' behavior. So they want to understand what is it that's actually having a real effect. What are, what are the causes? And you know, this is very, very hard to do. So I'll talk about some of the ingredients of how to do that. So the first thing that we think is important is joining up all the data. What we do is we take uh, our customers' data, and they have, they're interacting with their customers through many, many channels. And we join all of that up around an individual. And this, Believe me, it's very, very hard. So I don't know about you, I have two work computers, I've got two home computers, but I share my wife, I've got an iPhone, I've got an iPad. So just on the web, there's quite a lot of stuff to piece together. Then you take you know, email and other channels. It's very, very hard to join all this together. Um, but you know, it's important. And here's one way to do it. Here's how we go about doing it. So you have a series here of, each, each of these circles is meant to represent a chunk of customer activity. So some online activity or some store activity. And what we do is we observe co-occurrences of identifying information in order to essentially learn this network graph of how does this data relate one piece to another. So how can you piece together a complete picture of that digital? So the easiest one is an online purchase. Here's somebody who registers, they log into a site, they set a password, they give you their credit card, they give you their delivery address. Great, you, you know, you're clear who that person is. Now you can link that maybe to some online browsing activity through the browser cookie. But of course, you know, it could be that person, it could be somebody else in their family who uses the same computer. So it might be them, it might be not. It's a little bit more of a grey area. Um, a store purchase, if it's made with the same credit card, you could say, aha, that, that store data is the same as the online person. So great, you can link those together. Maybe somebody paid with cash in a store, now that's difficult. But if they use the same loyalty card that they use with a credit card, you can piece that together. Maybe they make another store purchase with cash, but they get it delivered. And if the delivery address matches the one from the online purchase, <coughs> same person. Or is it? Maybe it's a gift, maybe they've sent it. So piecing all this together is, is quite a messy problem. And I think an important lesson for us is you have to deal with ambiguity. Ambiguity is an inherent part of the problem. Ambiguity, I think, is a big part of big data. And you know, enterprises like to talk about single version of the truth and so on. I think it's a, it's a complete fallacy. The right thing to do is recognize that the data is messy, that there's ambiguity in the data, and deal with that according to what you want to do with the data. And so Amazon, for example, they, they operate at one extreme. Basically, they're fairly relaxed about it. They, you know, they take the view that you're the same person who came back last time unless you tell them differently. And frankly, what's the worst thing that can happen? You can get some, you know, some slightly um, mismatched recommendations. Um, a bank, on the other hand, you know, they're hyper security aware. If they get it wrong, then you know you're going to be worried. Is it, is it a phishing site? Is your account being hacked? Is this bank just inept? So they're going to operate at the other extreme. And so the point is, you match all this data up, and you want to set the bar for what you call a match according to what you want to use the data for. And it may be that you wish to set the bar at a different level for different activities within the same enterprise. Maybe you want to set the bar differently for making a decision on a website compared to sending somebody an email, or compared to making a firm offer of credit, let's say, something like that. Okay, so what's all this got to do with cause and effect? We haven't really gone into cause and effect yet. Um, piecing together the data, we believe, is extremely important, getting this full picture of the customer. Let's take a retail example. So this is the John Lewis website. John Lewis isn't a customer, by the way. Um, people look at products on John Lewis, but what if they actually go to the shop to buy them? Now, retailers know that this happens all the time. People research products online, and they buy them in stores. They know this happens all the time from survey data. But that's all they know. They can't piece together what an individual is doing online and when they actually go into a shop. And so, for a marketer, it's a nightmare. Are they cannibalizing their own business? Are they competing with themselves? Is their investment in online marketing actually helping them in the store? 
it's a complete mess. If they could join the data up at an individual level, then they have a much better chance of understanding, ah uh, yes, you've actually induced this person to do this. So we believe that joining that data together is a very, very important first part of doing so. If you don't do that, then you have basically a censored data set. You can see if somebody bought online, but if they didn't buy online, you can't say for sure they didn't buy. So it's very, very hard to, to draw a real conclusion from that. So that's one important part. Okay, so the next important part, we think, is retaining all of the time information. So what we do is we store all of the interactions in all the different channels in a granular time series by customer. We, we figure out all the data around the individual customer, and we store it in a time series. And the reason we do that is we believe that the time information is crucial in understanding causality. So causes precede effects. And so it's, if you like, necessary but not sufficient to retain that time information to have a chance of understanding causality. And um, if you lose that time information, if you aggregate it up in a data warehouse or in a queue or something, then you lose some very, very important predictive information. So what we store in our system is a whole load of these time sequences for individual customers. And then if you have a load of these, you can compare them to each other and you can learn from them. So we have what we, you know, what we call here customer journeys. And maybe you're looking at a particular type of interaction. Maybe you're a marketer and you want to know, does offering somebody a loyalty card, if they take that loyalty card, do they become a better customer? Do they spend more with you? Or actually, is that loyalty card just a cost that I don't want to support? So you get lots and lots of examples of customers who were offered loyalty cards. You see how it played out. Now, of course, what you want to do is, is learn from all this data. The problem is it's very, very messy. So there's, you know, there's structure around these interactions that we've got, but it's, it's semi-structured data. And everything's moving around and spaced around differently in time. So you want to try to get these into a similar structure so that you're comparing a like with like. And what we do is we filter out, first of all, we select the customer journeys where there has been this interaction that you're interested in, the offer or a loyalty guard or something, and then we line up the records. So we, we shift away from working in calendar time, and we line up the records around that interaction of interest, and we work in relative time. And we believe that what really counts in terms of understanding influence is what were they doing right before that interaction? What was the last thing they did? What did they do in the previous hour, in the previous day, in the previous week? And then what did they go on to do? Because you have these time series. So you can look at this data and look at the outcomes and look at the future. And then we summarize that data up because this is still a lot of data to analyze and turn it into what we call scenario records. So basically trained records. Okay? And then you can build models. So now you can build models on this data. You can look at which predictors in the past strongly predicted outcomes in the future. The problem is, it's incredibly hard to establish causation from passively observed data. It's just incredibly hard. If you look at, just think how long it took to establish the link between smoking and lung cancer. It's just very, very hard if you're passively observed data. There, you know, there are things like range of causality. People have done a lot of good work with uh, Bayesian networks. But basically, it's very, very hard. And our approach is basically, it's too hard. So what else can you do? I mean, I'm not saying all this other stuff structure for data isn't very, very important, but I think there's another approach that you can take, and that is to do experiments. So, if you like, this is putting the science into data science. You want to do experiments. And because what we're doing, because either is mediating the interaction on behalf of the enterprise with the customer, you can try stuff. You can do experiments. So what does it mean to do an experiment? Um, the very simplest example probably is A-B testing, which I guess everybody's familiar with. You have maybe a couple of different calls of calls to action on your website, and you want to see which one is the most effective. So you split your customer screen into two halves, and you show one half the first creative, you show the other half the second creative, and you just measure what happens. You let the data tell you. And you can see, ah oh, yes, one is clearly better than the other one, and you adopt that. And then you can iteratively do this. And this is now obviously very, very widely used. The next step on from that is what are termed banded algorithms. So if you look at something like computational advertising, where you have a number of ads that you might show in a, in a banner slot, what you have to do is determine which one has the highest response rate. And you do that by serving it and by measuring the response rate. Now this is called uh, the multi arm banded problem because it's akin to having a row of slot machines, each one with a different payout rate. And what you, what you need to do, your task is to establish which um, slot machine has the highest payout rate. And the way that you do that is by playing the slot machines. But you don't want to play the low paying out slot machines too, for too long. So um, bandit algorithms are a very disciplined, um, statistically rigorous way of choosing when to stop playing the poorly performing um, 
top shoes. Basically, you have to balance exploration versus exploitation of the knowledge you have, so that you minimize the cost of exploring and latch on to the best, um, best option. So this is what goes on in, in proper technology. Now, imagine if the slot machines got wise and they changed their behavior depending on what you were doing. So their payouts change depending on how you play them. Now, this is, of course, what people are doing. I mean, if you, if you go back to the market, for example, Marketers are trying to influence their customers, so the customers do change their behavior as a result of what's going on. And so the problem gets harder again, and that really is the domain that we operate in. Um, and so the approach that we take is reinforcement learning, a, a variant of reinforcement learning, where essentially it's a dance. So Causata is, is mediating the interactions on behalf of an enterprise, interacting with the environment, namely the customer, and the way the interaction works is the marketer takes actions and the customer responds with rewards. And then you learn, ah, yes, that was a positive outcome, I'll do more of that, that was a negative outcome, I'll do less of that. So the, you learn how to interact better with your customers. But of course the customer learns as well and changes their behavior. And it's a feedback loop, it's, it's a constant um, cycling thing. There are a couple of very nice things, by the way, about having joined <coughs> the data. Because that means you can look at meaningful actions that really count. You can optimize against real goals. And if you have all the data in time series as well, you can start to optimize against things out in the future, not immediate proxies like the next click. So what this reduces to for us is basically, you know, I say basically is that we're easy, learning a very complex tree. So imagine that your customer is this white circle and they're in some states and you have a couple of actions that you could take. Maybe you could send them an email or not send them. And in this case, you know, the, the blue line, you choose to send them an email. They then have choices. They could click on the link in that email or not. Um, then, you know, that changes their set. Something's happened. Now, you can choose which action to take again. They can choose how to respond. You can choose which action to take, and so on. So it's a, an incremental, iterative series of actions. So that's the, the path that one customer takes. But of course, there are many other branches that can happen at each stage. You could have done something different. The environment, the customer could have done something different. And, and the problem, basically, is trying to learn this complex tree and then generalize across it. And so this is very, very hard, of course. This is you know, very combinatorically complex. In this case, I've just taken two forks at every point of the road, but typically there are many actions that you can take. There are many ways that the customer can respond, and the customer's response might be you know, continuous rather than binary as well. But the basic problem is come up with a reinforcement learning approach that will learn this complex tree. And if you can propagate information from the bottom nodes further up to the top, then you can make predictions further out in the future. And that's, that's what we try to do. What this then means is, you know, you can do a lot better than the current state of the art. So any, any sales, any marketing interaction is a sequence really of steps, you know, sales funnels and so on. A sequence of steps. In this case, it's a, a credit card example. There are a whole bunch of steps, and the goal is always to get the customer on to the next step. And the current state of the art really is to locally optimize each interaction in terms of nudging the next step. Now why is that? It's because people really only ever have the local data. If you're doing something on the website, you want to try to drive somebody to click or to download an application form. If you have all of the connected up data, you can move beyond this local optimization and you can do global optimization, optimizing against real long-term business goals, uh, things that really count. Now, of course, another interesting aspect of the problem for us is scale. Uh, that's both a blessing and a curse, of course. If you're doing statistical learning, then scale is great. You want lots and lots of data. But it also means that architecturally, your system has to scale. You have to be able to parallelize your machine learning, etc. Et so that, that keeps us awake at night. Um, and of course, you have to do it fast. So as well as scaling, low latency is crucial. If you're trying to influence customers, then you need to do it fast. You've either got them in front of you physically, uh, uh, you know, a checkout in a shop, or maybe metaphorically, um, they're on the website. You've got the time it takes that web page to load to make one of these intelligent decisions. And the point really is to take that graph and try to orchestrate all of the actions that you're taking. So have an experimentation framework that allows you to actively learn rather than passively observing what's going on. Taking into account everything that you know from all of the data that you have. And if you have that experimentation framework, then you can start to get a handle on causation. So really, just to, to summarize um, what you know, we see as the key ingredients to try to understand causality of data. The first thing, I think, is connecting the data. Um, 
data gets much, much richer and more powerful if you can connect the data sets. But you have to recognize that there's going to be ambiguity in doing that, and you have to live with that. You can't just push it away. Um, making intelligent decisions with machine learning. It's, you know, it's very, very exciting times now for machine learning, obviously, with lots of data, lots of people there. And an important part of really trying to get to um, causation is principled experimentation. So not just ad hoc trying things, but you know, using the knowledge that you have, using a statistical framework, automating your actions in order to experiment in a principled way at massive scale in real time, just to keep it in mind. So I want to close really just by um, asking one question or trying to answer one question, which I think gets asked a lot at events like this. There aren't enough data scientists, there's a, there's a skills gap. How does one become a data scientist? And it's very, very easy, there are two steps. Uh, first of all, quit your job. <laughs> Secondly, come and work with us. Um, I started off on selling, that was a bit of a fib. Um, if you're a little bit you know, cautious and you don't want to jump straight to step one, then please um, at least do step zero. <laughs> Thank you very much. Great.